Good morning, everyone. You are listening to 91.7 The Edge, WSUW Whitewater. You are now listening to the Farms Radio Show. This is your host, Ken. And for this week's guest, we are going to be talking about farming history. Specifically, we're going to be talking about farming in a pre-modern and modern society. What do I mean by that? Well, you'll just have to find out in a little while. But for today's guest, we have Professor of a uh, professor of history here at Whitewater, and that professor is Jennifer Thibodeau. Jennifer, thank you coming for coming on to the show today. Thanks, Ken. All right, so we got a lot to talk about today, and as I said, our focus today is going to be on history lessons for everyone listening. <laughs> I'm sure that we have a lot of farmers that listen to the show, and right now in America, a lot of people have it pretty good if you're a farmer. I mean, we have our own issues, but... How would that compare to, say, living in a medieval times or in the case of a societal collapse? Those are all questions I'm sure are on everyone's minds every day. So we're going to answer some of those questions today, too. But first, before we get into all that meat and potatoes, let's talk a little bit about you and why we're going to be talking about this today. So first of all, um, before we get into what you do specifically here at Whitewater, you're a professor of history. You obviously have an interest in history. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into this topic area, this career line? Okay, well, I, you know, I don't know that anyone falls into being a medieval historian, but I certainly did. Um, I was always interested in history as, uh, as a young person. I found European history to be especially fascinating. Um, as a native of Texas, we got a lot of U.S. history and Texas history, which I know uh, Texas history is very appealing to a lot of people, but we got so much of it that I was really driven away from Texas history as a child. So I was really interested in, in I guess, the subject that I didn't get a lot of, which was European history. So when I went to college, I, uh, I went to two different colleges. I actually was a transfer student, but I was always interested in history, and I was fascinated by the, the scope of history courses that were available to me, particularly in European history. So I, I always took a history course every semester, but what was unusual is that I was not a history major. Um, I, in fact, I, like a lot of, I think, college students, kind of changed their mind. You know, I thought, well, first I was going to be an international studies major, and then I decided I was really good at languages. So I started studying French. And French was something, as my last name indicates, is my heritage. And so my ancestors came over from France to Canada and then from Canada to Louisiana, um, where there's a lot of Thibodeaux. If you go to Louisiana today, no one, no one ever asked me how to pronounce my last name or spell it. It's awesome. Uh, so I was kind of, I think, naturally drawn to French history and to the French language. But still, you know, I studied... French, and then I one day had an epiphany that uh, maybe I should be a history major and minor in French, and the two subjects would go together. So that's how I kind of, you know, started with my interest in history, and particularly French history. And for this little epiphany you said you had, was it something that someone else led you on to, or was it something that you just, it just kind of came to you one day more out of the blue, or was more spontaneous? Well, I... I guess it was kind of an epiphany. Um, you know, certainly I was, I was good at, at the French language, but I think when you study French, when you get to the upper levels in French courses, you begin to study literature. And, you know, 20th century French literature didn't really appeal to me. So I didn't find it really interesting. What I found interesting about studying French was the ability to speak in the language and to converse and to travel to France. Um, so when I had that kind of moment where, you know, I love history, I'm good at history, I'm also good at the French language, why don't I simply major in history and then see where that leads me? All righty then. So for your studying with your travels abroad, I assume it was to France, as you said, mm -hmm. um, can you tell me a little bit about some of the um, milestones of that experience? Or you Sure. Know so I, you know, my first actual study abroad experience was in England. Mm. So, um, and it was during, a, I actually had two study abroads that I went to England uh, for six weeks, six weeks each time during the summer. And while I was in England, I was then able to, at the conclusion of that study abroad, fly over to France and then spend you know, a little bit of time there. 
then um, by that point, you know, I, I knew that in terms of going to graduate school, you, you specialize when you go to graduate school. And one of the ways that you specialize is generally what languages you have. If you're a European historian or a historian of, of anything but U.S. history, you're going to have to have a second language. Mm. And so my language was Fr French. So it made a lot of sense that French history would be where I would land. And so um, back in 2000, I actually had another study abroad experience, although on that trip, I was the instructor. And when I was in graduate school and I was able to live in Paris for six weeks and to basically you know, refine my, my uh, conversational French and to further develop my interests there. All right. That sounds very interesting. So during this time period, too, while you're um, traveling abroad, were you starting to formulate an idea of what you exactly want to do with your experiences, like for like future career work or? Well, you know, I definitely thought that being a professor was a track that I wanted to pursue. Um, and, you know, the it, it takes a long time to get a Ph.D. and to become a professor of history you have to have a PhD these days. There's simply, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, you could have a master's degree and that would have been sufficient. But you almost cannot find a job without having a PhD. And it takes a long time. And the thing about the PhD, I think it took me a total of six years plus two additional years that I did my master's degree. So we're looking at eight years total that I spent studying studying languages, uh, doing research, writing a, a dissertation, which is this an incredibly large book that um, that we write in order to get through our degree, um, that it's a real time commitment. So, But when I thought about sort of the ability to travel, to learn things that are interesting to me, and then share those things with students and find that kind of appreciation from, from a student that, you know, is interested, as interested as I was when I was younger, um, it's, it seemed like a really good career track for me. Oh, very nice. And I had no idea that you had to do that much line of work. I, I mean, I know other <laughs> history major students here, but I didn't know that. Like, they've all told me, oh, I'm going to go for my master's and eventually PhD, too. And I just kind of assumed that that was just more of a trendy thing to do. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that that was something that was like, you have to have this yeah, if you yeah. want to get to the point that... No, trendy. That point, like, <laughs> I've never heard it referred to <laughs> as that. And I think, you know, and, and here's a shout out to all of my uh, history colleagues in the in the department here at Whitewater and elsewhere that... Um, we really don't often share how intensive the doctorate is in history. Um, so I think we kind of make it look easy because we don't talk a lot about, you know, our struggles and, and how about 50% of the people that begin the PhD in history do not finish. Oh, wow. Um, for either they, they burn out or they just, you know, figure out that they don't want to do that anymore or they go broke. <laughs> That's also very common. Yeah, <laughs> pick one of your poisons. So, <laughs> but yeah, it sounds like it's definitely a lot of work involved too and a lot of determination. So, I definitely give my kudos to anyone that can get to that level yep, um, for their hard work. Um, so, getting more into the whitewater aspect of it now, can you tell us how you've gone from traveling, like living in different parts of the country, traveling to Europe? How did you end up finding Little Whitewater, Wisconsin? <laughs> little Whitewater, Wisconsin. Well, um, as part of finishing up a PhD, one of the things that we do is we begin going on to the job market. So the academic job market takes about a year. Um, so I, and it, it has to do with the, the university life, right? So we have semesters and you know, we're hired to teach in full academic years. So when I was finishing my PhD, I had already applied to jobs nationwide. And that's one of the things that most of us will do is we'll apply for jobs everywhere. And at the time, I went to graduate school at the University of Kansas. So I'd lived in Kansas for six years while I was working on the mm -hmm. PhD. Um, I met my husband there. And then we knew that when it was when I was finishing my dissertation, I was in that final semester that I would be interviewing and I was interviewing. Actually, I I interviewed at four different universities. Two were outside of Atlanta. Mm. One was in West Virginia and one was in Wisconsin. Huh. And uh, when I Wisconsin Whitewater was actually the last position I interviewed for. And when I got here, 
Uh, it had everything I wanted. It has this great, the UW system has a fantastic library system. Um, and I can't underscore that enough. Uh, it's really amazing, not only for students to be able to use those resources and to share those resources, but for us as scholars to be able to use those amazing collections. So Whitewater was the job that they offered me the position, and I took it, and we moved to Wisconsin. Oh, very nice. So, yeah, and I will definitely comment on your saying the UW library system, too. It's, I've always been impressed with just how well it's been uh, kept up and just how well it mm -hmm. competes with other national oh, libraries, absolutely. too. absolutely. Um, so... Here at Whitewater now that you end, we know how you ended up here now and how you got your work here as a professor. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about some of the courses you teach here and maybe some other projects that it might be working with students, it might be mm -hmm. um, class projects that are significant to you, or just other work you do with colleagues or even solo or work that you might plan to do. Okay. Well, um, since Whitewater is primarily a teaching college, which is distinguished from a research university such as Madison or Milwaukee, most of what we do here is teaching. So uh, most of us teach four courses a semester, and uh, we have some flexibility in what we teach, although um, we stay in our particular subject areas. My position was uh, listed as both an ancient um, and or a medieval European history position. And so I am a medieval Europeanist by training, but I am also um, able to teach ancient history courses here at UW-Whitewater. So mm -hmm. I teach a course generally online in ancient history, uh, which is focused primarily on Greece and Rome. I also teach a medieval European history survey. And right now I'm team teaching with my colleague Molly Patterson, a course on the Crusades, which is um, a really fantastic class, really interested students. Additionally to that, um, I have research interests in gender and sexuality, and so I'm able also to offer a course on early European women's history, which covers sort of from the ancient world to about the 17th century or so. And then I also um, sometimes offer a history of sexuality course, mm -hmm. which is mainly American and European history of sexuality. So I'm able to pursue my interests in that way, but I also I teach a wide range of, of courses. So, All right, then. And can you tell me, too, more about some of the other um, projects you might do or some of the books I know you mentioned that you've written and how um, they relate to some of the your sure, work? Sure. So I, um, I've, I've published a collection of edited essays back in 2010, which was on uh, masculine identity and the uh, medieval clergy. And then in 2015, I wrote um, a single authored book, The Manly Priest, which won a book prize in 2016, which I guess was just last year. It seems like the years just fly by. But um, so my interests previous to what I'm working on now have always revolved around um, issues of masculinity and um, sexuality and, and gender more generally. So, you know, I wrote this book about basically what happened uh, before and after it was decided by the medieval church that uh, Catholic priests should be celibate or they should remain unmarried for their entire lives. And so before 1123, they were able to marry um, and it was seemingly a matter of course. And then after 1123, they were no longer allowed to have valid marriages. And so what I was really interested in in that book was looking at the reaction. You know, what, what would it be like to be, you know, a Catholic priest in, let's say, 1100, and you have a family and you have a wife, and then, you know, 1123, the memo gets, gets disseminated <laughs> that, hey, guess what? You can't do this anymore. So that was my interest before. Um, right now, what I'm working on is, is something more closely related to um, farm history in many ways, because it's impacted, of course, by farm history, which is I'm looking at um, gender and sexuality during the conflict known as the Hundred Years' War, which is a war between England and France conducted on mostly French soil or northern French soil from about 1337 to 1453. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, as we'll, as we'll talk about later when we get into um, farming and so forth, there's there's a lot of impact, a lot of devastating impact that 
um, these kinds of conflicts have on the land. Hmm. Very interesting. And I think you'll make a great segue into our main <laughs> topics for today, too. So you obviously have a lot of understanding of pre-modern history, especially in Europe. Mm -hmm. So today's topic, as I mentioned before, is going to be a lot about the agriculture, the farming life, which mm -hmm. is for, if I'm correct, um, the majority of the people living during this medieval time period. Right. So just to give us a quick little history lesson, I'm sure everyone listening has heard of the medieval times. Can you first tell us when that time period was and what it, what was significant about it? Right. So the Middle Ages uh, generally is seen to constitute somewhere between 400 and about 1400, or sometimes you see the, the framework of, of 500 to 1500. It really depends on who you speak to. But no matter what official parameters we put on it, it's about a thousand years. It's from the fall of Rome, which the official fall of Rome of the Roman Empire occurred in about 476. And it goes until the time period that people designate as the Renaissance, which, you know, again, that's kind of a, a vague time period, but it's, you know, it can be late 14th or early 15th century or even later. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with the, you know, about 400 to 1500 as a designation for um, medieval life. All righty. So to get a better understanding of the day in the life in this medieval life, um, let's go into uh, the medieval village mm -hmm. in Europe and let's compare this pre-modern agriculture society, agriculture-based society to... Um, well, we'll get into comparing about how it relates to different parts of history up until modern days. But how was it in the life of these agriculture-driven um, villages? I know that a lot of people that lived there, most of them, correct me if I'm wrong, were peasants. I don't say that as a derogatory term. Right, right. I'm saying that that's what they were actually just called. Yes, And yes. how these villages were set up because there wasn't cities, really. There wasn't... Right. Um, main areas of land. There's these uh, smaller villages that are very agriculture-based. Can you tell us a little bit about the people that lived in these villages and sure. how they functioned? Well, first of all, um, you are correct in that well over 90% of the population are what we would call peasants. And again, it's a kind of a historical term. It's not derogatory like they're a bunch of peasants yeah. meaning something, <laughs> that, but it's actually a very, it's a very historical term. But even within that term peasant, I just want to take a moment to sort of show you how further compl complex this is. But there were... Um, as you know, in the early Middle Ages, so from around you know 400 to 1,000, you could still have slaves. So sort of leftovers from the Roman Empire, that kind of institution carried forward. You could also have um, what we call serfs, um, S-E-R-F-S, which I always want to say smurf when I say <laughs> serf, but that it's serf, is basically a semi-indentured um, laborer. So that is a person who is... Um, Working the land is not a slave, owns his own body, but has some kind of um, tie to the land that he can, he's not free to just pack up and leave. And then, of course, we have the third category, which would be sort of your free peasant or your person that is completely independent, a laborer, um, not owned, not tied to the land. So it's actually quite complex in the Middle Ages in terms of when we're saying peasant, what we're actually talking about. Um, could be a variety of any three of those categories. And of course, those categories really change over time. So for instance, by the time we get to the late Middle Ages, which is generally thought to be about 1300 to 1500, there are virtually no slaves in Northern Europe working land. There are virtually no serfs either. So what you have is due to some calamitous factors that I think we're going to talk about later on, there's a complete uh, sort of a freeing of people who work the land who are now fully independent. So it really can shift over time. All right, then. So with a lot of these farmers, can you tell us um, a little bit what they might do in a day? I mean, I, I just simply like don't know. Like if I were someone in this time period, besides managing my land, I mean, I'd imagine that um, I believe that things like um, the horse-drawn carriage, like I, I might be wrong, there's a horse-drawn mm -hmm. carriage and then the 
um, horse collar were kind of invented sometime during these medieval times. Right. But right. I know that the labor was much more intensive because of the te- technological limitations. Right. At the time. So let me um. So let me kind of like back up a little bit and give you sort of the the village structure okay. so that that because it it kind of makes more sense in that context. So you are right in that um. Uh, it was not, agriculture was not as productive um, as it is today. And in fact, you could probably expect that for every seed or bushel you planted in this time period, um, that you're going to get about a 25% yield. So when you think about it, it's, it's sort of um, a, a one to four, a four to one ratio rather that, you know, for every four seeds that you plant, you might get one crop out of that. Mm. So it wasn't really productive. And there was also a very limited use of fertilizer in this time period. So what they used for fertilizer was manure. And manure was, it was not widely used. It was um, actually something that people fought over, (laughs) that they could even um, take each other to court over manure rights, because manure could make the difference between um, a productive yield and, you know, a not such productive yield. And in addition to that, land was very easily exhausted. So mm. with those things in mind, what you have in terms of a village structure is you have throughout the Middle Ages, someone who takes the position as lord of the village. And what lord means is it can mean someone who is sort of the aristocratic elite in a village it could also mean a monastery could take on the corporate identity as the lord of the village. So it could be kind of a, an institution or it could be a person. Most often we see, and what we're, we're going to talk about is that it was a, a single family that sort of ruled over a village. Mm-hmm. And this family would, um, they would control, let's just say they control 200 acres of land. Obviously, they're not going to be able to farm all that land. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they, through a combination of those slaves, those serfs, and those free laborers, they have people work their land. Mm -hmm. And so we have something called the Lord's Demean, which is his entire land holding. And then he would parcel out pieces to uh, serfs who kind of functioned a little like sharecroppers, I think, in the Old South, where they would farm the land in exchange for being able to keep a portion of the land. Mm. So the Lord, you know, had quite a bit of control. But if it was a serf, if it was someone that was tied to the land, they not only farmed this parcel of land and gave most of it to the Lord, but they were also bound by that person's laws. Like he was the court system in his village. So he also could levy fines or fees. For instance, if you needed, if you wanted to marry someone, there'd be a fee he could levy. If you wanted to fish in his pond, he would levy a fine or a fee rather, right? Mm -hmm. Um, If he caught, if he caught you poaching from his forest, well, that, that could be really serious, but there'd definitely be a fine, Mm -hmm. possibly some kind of capital punishment (laughs) in this time period. So the lord of the village is basically in control of all of this land, um, controlling also social life and and things like forest rights and rights to timber. Um, But in terms of the average farmer, so the average farmer, this varies. And I want to also offer that I am speaking generally, um, and more particularly about Northern Europe. So, okay. um, so what I'm saying would apply definitely to England, France, and, and Germany, for instance. But maybe there, it would be different in the Mediterranean because it's a different climate, it's a different soil type, and it just yields a different culture. So in Northern Europe, um, there were great variation among peasant farmers. And you could have people that owned no land, who simply, you know, were just day laborers. Then you could have peasant farmers of a middling group, which they could own anywhere from 12 to 16 acres of land. Now, that's a lot, right? If you own a farm today outside of Whitewater and you have 16 acres, I imagine that's a lot of land. Mm -hmm. But you're also going to yield more 
from that land today than you are in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 12 to 16 acres of land isn't going to produce as much food as you think. It would probably, for a small family, it would feed them for a winter, mm. right? Okay. Um, now, there could also be peasant farmers that had more land than that, like the 40 to 50 acres, right? So, and you can see the same thing, that maybe they had more productive, um, they had a more productive yield simply because they had a larger amount of land. So that's kind of the setup. Now, in terms of, of inventions, there are some very monumental inventions that occur in the early Middle Ages, in the 700s, in the 800s, and certainly by the 900s. So when we think about the Middle Ages being this 400 to 1500 time span, you can kind of see that pretty early on there was this major agricultural shift. Mm -hmm. And this led to definite... Um, definitely beneficial things for medieval society. So um, one of the things is the three crop, the three field crop rotation system. Before this, um, people from the Roman era had used um, a two field system crop rotation. So in this time period, about the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries, you see the be they're beginning to use a system where they take their, their land and they divide it into thirds, and they only farm two-thirds of it as a at a time, and they leave the third fallow. And the idea being that you let the soil regenerate by not farming it. So in climates where you could have spring planting and fall planting, they definitely could farm the other, like two-thirds mm -hmm. of, the, of the land. And so they had a lot of food. And in fact, using this system, along with some of these other innovations, uh, doubled the food supply. Oh, wow. Yeah, it really, it, it mattered. And some of the things you mentioned earlier, like the, uh, I think you mentioned. Yeah, the carriage, maybe not the carriage, but the, maybe the, I, think, talking, I, I, I think, think you're talking it's, about the, t the tandem harnesses, probably. So yeah. there's this use of tandem harnesses for horses. Which, um, and the use of horseshoes, which greatly improved um, the use of animals in plowing fields. Mm -hmm. But what really helped was the invention of the heavy plow, the mm -hmm. heavy wheeled plow. So in Mediterranean Europe, they had the benefit of a plow, but they also had thinner, rockier soil. So it wasn't, um, they didn't have to go very deep. But in the, this time period I'm talking about, the 7th, uh, the, I'm sorry, the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries in Northern Europe, the invention of the heavy plow, um, the plow was heavier in wheeled, and there was a denser, richer soil in Northern Europe, so they had to get deeper mm. into plant. So this really revolutionized um, the growing, the, you know, the, the growing of, of plants and crops and such. So they used horseshoes, they had harnesses, they had this heavy plow, um, and it was driven by horses. So that's where the, you know, the harness and the, that all comes into play, the horseshoes, is because you're using farm animals to drive the really heavy plow to get, dig deep into the dirt so that there can be a substantial planting. Hmm. But something else that happened, they began to use more um, windmills hmm. and um, water mills. Oh, so a water mill was used to drain swamplands or sort of, uh, you know, waterlogged areas so that there could be more land for planting. Um, then you also have windmills, which actually speed up the production of flour because windmills were used to grind grain. Mm -hmm. So something that would have been done by hand, you could imagine how long that would take, with um, with a windmill, it actually sped up. And then, of course, you see later on in the Middle Ages that windmills are used for um, assisting with cloth production. Oh, really? So, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so, very interesting. Yep. And so to get a better idea, too, about what a, visual, a visualization of maybe the average farmland mm -hmm. in this time period, um, like when I think of farmland now here in Wisconsin, I think of the house the barn, mm -hmm. the mill, and then maybe sometimes you'll see like a greenery, or I mean right, greenhouse right, or two, right. and then like the fields. So what would all be on the land of 
the kind of people would it just be a house like from my understanding that i think it would be it'd be like a house sometimes it might keep the the livestock in the house some yeah. or sometimes we'll have the fields nearby. It, it's not that it's um, up to cleanly standards of nowadays. So. Well, okay. So um, so let's go back to the Middle Ages for a second and visualize okay. this. So what you're seeing around us in outside of Whitewater and in anywhere really in Wisconsin and in rural Wisconsin is you're seeing individualized, uh, individually owned farms. So in the Middle Ages... The land that is farmed is, in fact, um, I don't want to say communal, but it is kind of communal. It's outside of the village. Mm. So everyone lives in the village. So you might have a row of five or six cottages on each side of a dirt road. Let's just visualize that for a second. Um, That's your village. Everyone leaves the village to work the land outside of the village. So, you know, it's kind of like um, they're going outside of downtown to go and work, <laughs> okay? Um, in terms of the average house, yes, it's very different. These are homes made out of basically mud and straw with um, thatched roofs, which, as you can imagine, can catch fire very easily. The interiors of these homes... They're very small. Um, they're generally windowless. If they have a window, there's of course, there's no glass. And they do burn fires inside of their mm-hmm. cottage. So if you can imagine a dirt floor with maybe something called rushes thrown on the floor, and a ru- you know, rushes are like straw and maybe herbs and something to make it smell good, mm-hmm. basically to try to help keep you know the feet relatively mud-free, okay? Mm-hmm. Then you have a hearth where you're going to, you know, you're going to burn something because you have to cook inside of your of your cottage. And as you might imagine, the insides of these cottages would have been very smoky, uh, smoke filled. Um, and we know that, you know, soot kind of collects. Right. And I'm sure it collected on the people as well as on the walls or on the, you know, the objects they had in the house. So we're talking about essentially one room homes and everyone lived in the home. So the entire family and the animals lived inside the cottage, the one room cottage. Uh, yeah, you could have chickens walking around on you while you slept. <laughs> this is this is true. Yes. And yes, it is less cleanly than um, the less cleanliness than we are used to. <laughs> um, there wasn't a lot of washing. Um if they did wash, they generally used, um, you know, a big pot of some kind, a big basin, and they might have all used the same water, okay. right? Because, I mean, if you can imagine, they can heat the water and then they have to quickly get in and out and, and clean up. So, yeah, you could have definitely um, animals um, inside your house as well as you'd sleep on the floor. They didn't hmm. have chairs, um, for most of the Middle Ages, these these families would have just um, sat on stools, mm. you know, around makeshift know tables. Um, there wasn't a lot of furniture um, inside the home. So, oh, I had no idea about the furniture part of that too. Mm-hmm. I mean, I imagine it wouldn't be as high quality, but still, it's I had no idea that that was just right. lacking with th- like common amenities we can take for granted, such as chairs. Yeah. Yep. Um. So, understanding more about this village too. Um, a few more questions I have about okay. that is, was there, um, with a lot of these villages, were they stationary? Were they some of them mobile? Um, or that would people travel? I mean, uh, I think reading up on this topic, I saw how most of them would usually stay in one area, but some of them too would travel around if, um, maybe soil erosion or things like that would occur or just right. bad weather. Right. So most people would be born and would live and die in the same place. Oh, really? Yeah, vast majority. And that's really where their ties were. You know, um, medieval people, the medieval, typical medieval laborer, peasant farmer, would not have traveled far and wide. He, he or she would have stayed in the same place. Um, they would know everyone in that little village. They would, you know, as children play with, other children whom they would grow up and probably marry one day and have their own children with. 
So it was, um, you know, it was a small community that was pretty much stable until something bad happened. Mm. <laughs> um, and towards the end of the Middle Ages, there are a series of calamities that occur, which will cause migration, certainly, out of the village. For lack of a better term, there's, there's nothing there at that point. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to move into that segment of the conversation, but um, most people would have stayed in the same place, definitely. Now, towards the end of the Middle Ages, as we see uh, more market towns emerging, mm. um, more trade, more commercial activities, there may have been short-term travel um, from villages to bigger market towns for the selling of goods. You know, if there was cloth being produced in, in one village, they might have um, carted that to the market town or to the fairs to sell their goods, um, as well as other kinds of, of commodities and so forth. Um, but people were pretty much, you know, tied locally. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. And we will move into the whole topic of what might cause them to move or some of these disasters happen. One more question I did have on the village lifestyle, though, before we move mm -hmm. on is you don't have to go into detail here how um, like too much detail but for just the people that lived in these villages these peasants mm -hmm. these laborers um would they be working usually i assume like pretty much all day yes. with the exception of sleeping yes so they worked six days a week uh, sun up to sundown mm. and if you think about it without electricity um you, you had very little to light the home at night and candles were very expensive. Mm. So, and as you know, a candle only lasts so long, right? Not to mention that there's a, a continued risk of fire by leaving, you know, candles burning. So basically when the sun went down, it was time to go to sleep. Um, but sun up to sun down, it was, it was constant work and the work varied depending on who you were. Children were expected to contribute as soon as they were able to. Women certainly uh, shared the labor with men. Women worked in the fields alongside men, but they also uh, worked inside, inside and outside the home by um, cooking or milking cows or baking bread or milling flour or any of just feeding the livestock, right, and taking care of the animals. So it was. Now, the Christian church in the Middle Ages had a lot of feast days. A lot. And when it was a feast day, you didn't work on a feast day. So even though I said it was six days a week, obviously Sunday, there's no work on Sunday. Um, you might expect that there were so many feast days that people did get days off periodically oh, from, okay. from labor. So. All right. That makes sense. And yeah, it, it's easy to the thing I always just forget is that I was thinking, oh, yeah, candles, too. Um. For staying up at night, but yeah, it's I, I always forget that that was just such a normal thing that once it's night, I mean, you can't really do anything beyond right. that point. I mean, if you do, it's it's very hard to see, of course, mm -hmm. and it might even be dangerous to imagine with maybe predators or cold weather. Um, well, and it was, and and I do want to um, emphasize for a moment that you know houses did burn down and children were maimed or killed accidentally because mm -hmm. often the warmest place for you to put the baby was close to the fire. Oh. So and there are there are tragedies, certainly. Um, this this was not an easy life. Um, I don't want to, you know, judge it by our standards, but it, definitely there were hazards. Yeah. And I imagine, too, even the average longevity around this time period is somewhere between like maybe 20 and 30-ish. Um, yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, we have a lot of examples of people that lived beyond that, but for the the average peasant, I would think life expectancy probably was 40. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, a little bit higher than I, I anticipated, yeah. so I'm not, not good for them. Yeah. Um, so moving on to situations that might have changed this lifestyle or disasters. It can be even historical events if you want to use examples. Do you want to bring us into the topic of um, what some of these migration situations mm -hmm. might have looked like or some of these disasters, whether natural or political involved? Sure, sure. So um, in the later Middle Ages, we, we have like, for one thing, I told you that the, the food supply doubled. It was, you know, all of those innovations from the early Middle Ages um, was able to sort of double the crop production. And people were pretty well fed. 
Um, in fact, um, there's some evidence from the ninth century that, you know, they might have had anywhere from 1,800 to 2,000 calories a day if they were oh, wow. a member of the elite, right, which is basically what we eat. Yeah, so, that's pretty impressive. Um, so there is some suggestion that um, at least if you were part of the aristocratic elite, you, you were very, very, very well fed. But even even the average person would have most of the time gotten enough food. Mm. In the later Middle Ages, we have a series of calamities that – occur, which make it more challenging to farm land and which leads to a lot of social disruption. So the first thing to mention is that in the 14th century, generally right around 1314, there was a series of cold and very rainy winters, which changed um, the ability to productively farm. Hmm. And these cold and wet winters over a series of years led to a famine. And so we see the peak of this famine from around 1315 to about 1322. Mm -hmm. And during that time, literally people starved to death. Oh. And so 10% of the population was lost from this period of famine. Now, something that happens when we have a population decline, I try not to emphasize this too much, but um, it actually... Um, allowed more people access to more arable land because there was less competition for it. Oh. Um, then for going further into this time period from, so we just, you know, we get out of this famine by about 1322, things start to rebound. But then of course, if you know your medieval history, you know that in 1348, we have the impact of something called the Black Death, which is um, bubonic plague, combined with two other strains of plague that uh, has a devastating consequence all across Europe. It begins from the Mediterranean. It moves northward. It has the ability as a disease to wipe out an entire town or village. Um, we have evidence of what we call plague villages today. Some are in England that are basically very relatively well-preserved empty villages that people, everyone died from the plague or they, most of them died and the, the survivors left. Hmm. And there's literally, it creates something of, of a chaotic moment in the history of agriculture because as you know, well, the Black Death, we think killed off about 33% of the population. That's hmm. pretty steep. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can imagine living in a medieval village of 100, let's just say, and 90 people die from plague, the 10 people surviving don't have a lot of options <laughs> in terms mm -hmm. of what they're going to do. Because, you know, not to, to coin the phrase, it takes a village, but literally it does take a village <laughs> to produce food. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those 10 people... They don't have enough labor to, to make it on their own. So they might decide to migrate to another village where there are more survivors. They might decide to migrate to a town and just become a day laborer. Um, you know, we don't know, but we do know that they definitely migrated. And we know that the social connections were disrupted. Families, entire families were wiped out. They might have left a kid behind or a parent behind and and you kind of think well what happens where do they go what do they do mm -hmm. but more importantly who's farming the land mm -hmm. so during the time of the black death um with the incredible decline in population and most of those by the way were the peasants because they were in a sense not as well nourished as the elite so you know, they had weaker immune systems, which made them more susceptible to infection and to death from infection. So, so here they are, they've, they've died off, and you have survivors behind who can now demand a higher wage hmm. to work. Hmm. So this becomes, I don't want to say it's a good news, bad news thing, because it's, it's a terrible event in the moment of human society. But it does mean that these survivors, these people that don't die from the plague, are able to demand higher wages, 
at a standard that they have never had in their lifetime or their parents' lifetime or their grandparents' lifetime because there's simply not enough people to work the land. Mm -hmm. um, there are some efforts on the part of state authorities, even royal authorities, to cap wages so that these laborers can't demand more wages, um, which ultimately fail because people still need to work the land. But when you look at food production, um, food production declines, obviously, because there's just not enough people to farm the land. So you're not yielding enough crops, so you don't have enough crops to go around. So you have sort of a combination of disease and famine that work together and at odds to further diminish the population. Another event that occurs about this time and that continues into the next century is something called the Hundred Years' War. And this particularly affected Northern Europe, England, and France. It was a war that was fought over succession to the French throne. And through a series of crazy family relationships, the King of England basically can claim succession to the French throne. Mm. And you know that really scared the French. <laughs> so um, long story short, not to go to the, the, all these you know, crazy details, but the English invade northern France. And as part of that invasion, they developed a style in the 15th century called a, a slash and burn warfare, mm -hmm. where their technique was to go into a region and set the fields on fire. Now, yeah. you can imagine in terms of farming, you're already, you're already devastated. You don't have enough people to work the land. You're starting to recover. And now you have, literally, you cannot farm because someone has lit your fields on fire. Yeah, not a good time to be alive there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and that, that caused migration. Certainly, as people fled from those villages to the fortified towns for protection, um, again, it, it results in this kind of um, really terrible combination of circumstances. Alrighty. And I think that would be the closest segue we can get into our last topic of conversation. We have about 10 minutes left here okay. we can chat, so... We'll do a fun little thought experiment for this part, too, um, about how this would relate this kind of, especially during the Hundred Years' War example you gave, how this could relate to a societal collapse. And if you're a farmer now, let's say in America, and a societal collapse happened, how would you be able to get by, and what would you have to change about yourself, too? And I know when we discussed before, too, we were talking about the example of The Walking Dead. Yes, The and Walking Dead. Yes, and if, if there's anyone that's listening that's not aware, The Walking Dead is a TV and graphic novel series that's basically zombies happen, America <laughs> collapses. <laughs> and the interesting part about this whole story is that it's the, while the zombie outbreak is the causal factor, it focuses more on human versus human relations within this society and getting by. So as a fun thought experiment, how would you think, like how would you relate, say, the Hundred Years' War or just this medieval life to, say, a similar scenario if it's something like The Walking Dead or just um, a collapse in structured uh, society in America for farmers? What might that mean? So at least we'd have the advantages of technology, but... But, but a lot of problems there with generating energy for technology to work. Mm. Yeah, you know, um, I am a huge fan of The Walking Dead, and mm -hmm. it, is, it is gory, I know. It's very unscholarly. But what I like about the show is how it kind of makes me think on a deeper level about my own subject, my own research interests, and what happens when... You know, society collapses. And, of course, in The Walking Dead, you know, civilization has collapsed. Mm -hmm. um, during the Hundred Years' War, I wouldn't say civilization collapsed. I'd say, you know, temporarily society collapsed. But there's certainly a lot of common themes. And I know that one of the common themes about The Walking Dead is food. Mm -hmm. Where do you get food? And one of the things they're always doing is they're trying to scavenge, which you would think after three years of the zombie apocalypse that there just wouldn't be enough canned goods left mm -hmm. anymore, <laughs> that they would have all been taken and consumed. But um, you see this shift to we have to produce food, but of course they, they have a limited supply of fuel 
although they seem to be able to drive cars all the time. So I don't know where they're getting all the <laughs> gasoline. Um, but, you know, the things that farmers use today, their tractors, their combines, um, you know, that helps them farm all those acres. Um, I could imagine that when you don't have that present, you're going to yield a smaller amount of food. And of course, you know, this post-apocalyptic society of the walking dead has a lot in common with medieval life in that you don't have mechanized forms of labor. You can't use machinery um, because you don't have the same, you don't have fuel or you don't have electricity. You can't generate energy mm -hmm. to make your machines run. So what would you do? And um, I think there's this hysterical moment um, in The Walking Dead from the last season or so where the, the colony at Alexandria meets the people at the hilltop. And, you know, here it is, another group of survivors that is um, functioning and, you know, they're growing all kinds of food at the hilltop colony. They're, they're growing sorghum, which I've never even heard of until I watched The Walking Dead. <laughs> um, I'm not still not sure what it is, but I think I know I can eat it in the event of a zombie apocalypse. Um, <laughs> But they're growing a lot of um, heavy-duty crops that are sustaining a small community. They're making bread. They can make pies. They've, they've got it down, right? They know what they're doing. And then, you know, the, the spokeswoman for Alexandria speaks to the spokesman at Hilltop about trade. And, you know, the spokesman at Hilltop's kind of like, well, what do you have to trade? You know, what are you growing? We've got all of this food. And she says, well, we're growing cucumbers and tomatoes. <laughs> and it's kind of hysterical because you're like, wow, wow, that will be a nice salad. <laughs> mm -hmm. So but that's certainly not enough calories. That's not, you know, that kind of nutrient dense food that you need to survive. But you can grow it in a garden. I have, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, I've struggled with cucumbers. But you know, you can grow that in a garden, but that's not the kind of farming you need to do to produce food for a community, mm -hmm. clearly. So it's very interesting to see sort of these these relationships, this kind of, well, if, you know, if we have a zombie apocalypse one day or any <laughs> other kind of apocalypse that wipes out our energy supply, our, our ability to use machines, how will we produce mm -hmm. food. And then I think, well, what did they do in the Middle Ages? Yeah. You know, it takes me back. Well, what did they do? Okay. It can be done. It can be done slower, you mm -hmm. know, and you have to plan, but it can be done. Yeah. I think that the one advantage would be just more better methods of farming you have nowadays. But yeah, you are definitely right with the whole concept of that during the Middle Ages, you had a basic idea of practicing agriculture, practicing right, farming. Right, right. And when all else fails, at least you have that. But th it is, it's so relatable in mm -hmm. that aspect, too. So, And, of course, we can go on and on and on about right. evaluating that, too, which would be very interesting. Well, but, and if I could just point out for a mm -hmm. second, in the, in the Middle Ages, even during times of famine, which we knew fell heavy um, on the peasant population, um, townspeople suffered more during times of famine than the peasants did because mm. peasants actually knew how to forage from the land. Mm. Townspeople, you know, bought their food at the market from people that, that grew it. So, I mean, I think it's, it's kind of a relevant distinction today that I think, you know, our farmers are going to be the people that know how to get stuff done um, and the people that are removed from food, mm. from the production of food, will be the ones that had this panic of, I can't go to the grocery store. Where do I get my food yeah. from? Can I can I eat cucumbers and tomatoes? Yeah. What do you think is almost like um, Eugene, just strictly the medieval example too, that the people during these times of um, famine that were living off the land, like the farmer types, um, do you think there'd be more of a combination of a traditional agriculture farmer and someone that's also lived, that could also live more like a nomad would pre-agriculture era? That could also find that kind of food, like somewhere, um, somewhere in between there, maybe lean more towards agriculture. Right. Yeah, I think so. But I also think, I mean, and I, you know, there's a lot of hunting that goes on in Wisconsin. I certainly yeah. know when when hunting season is. My students tell me because mm. they're going to be gone. Um, but I do think that that's the other, you know, the other part of the picture when it comes to sustaining during a time like an apocalypse. Um, <laughs> Which, you know, if I can point out, in the Middle Ages, um, meat was not a staple of the diet. It was actually grain or grains, barley, um, wheat. Mm 
um, vegetables and so forth. So meat was really more of a luxury item that was reserved for high holidays. Mm. Um, and in that case, it, it would likely to be pork. They almost never slaughtered cows or, or oxen for, for meat um, or wild game. Mm. So, you know, again, if you can hunt, you know, and that's why I say I think peasants did better sometimes over the townspeople because they at least knew where they could forage from the land and possibly where they could they could find wild game to hunt. So mm. even in, you know, primitive ways, but they could certainly do that. Yeah, it's very interesting. And I can definitely understand, too, how usually as society gets more advanced, there tends to be um, more meat in the diet, too. So during yes. the time period, it, it's um, a lot of, like if you were to grow meat, a lot of, what you could otherwise be eating right. um, as crops is now going to meat and while well, it might taste better to some people, it's just... Right. Well, and you know, in the more, in the Middle yeah. Ages and medieval villages, I mean, cows supplied milk, sheep supplied milk. Yeah. You know, you could make butter, you could make cheese. I mean, you could, you could get more out of an animal from its products than from slaughtering it for its meat. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'd love to talk more, but we'll have to wrap it up for today. Okay. So I think it's been a very interesting conversation, and we've learned a lot about how it used to be, like old history lessons. So I think it's been <laughs> very, very enjoyable. I've really had a lot of fun with this conversation. Great. Well, thanks, Ken, for uh, having me on. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. And is there any less uh, messages you have for our audience on this topic or any less um, – books you'd like to advertise for yourself that you're doing? <laughs> uh, no, no. I um, I mean, if, if anyone is interested in learning more about um, medieval village life, there is a, a relatively solid book called Life in a Medieval Village. And there's also a, a companion volume, Life in a Medieval Castle, which is actually mm. also very interesting, written by Francis and Joseph Guise. And uh, these books are about 30 years old, 40 years old, but they're they're pretty solid in describing some of what we've talked about today. So, Alrighty. Sounds good. Well, hey, Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on to the show today. Great. Thanks, Ken. Alrighty. Well, everyone, you've been listening to 91.7 The Edge, WSUW Whitewater. This has been the Farms Radio Show. Farms Radio Show is brought to you by the Wisconsin Farms Oral History Project. You can find us on Facebook at Wisconsin Farms Oral History Project. Or you can find us at our website, wisconsinfarms.org. Once again, that's wisconsinfarms.org, where if you have a story to tell and you're in the agriculture industry, send us an email on our contact page. We'd love to hear your story and share it with everyone else. Anyways, 